Midnight Train, original author, unknown. In my old age, I've seen a lot of things. Some things I'm a little more proud of than others. As a boy, there wasn't a damn thing that could satiate my appetite for the world around me. Everything in reach I had to get my hands on, take it apart, and study it. My natural curiosity is what got me into many of the scrapes and situations of my youth. I remember when uh, I wasn't any older than, I don't know, maybe six? It was the fall of 1928. Me and several of the local boys were out playing a game of hide and seek. Denny Lewis, he was the seeker, and a damn good one at that. So I took it upon myself to find a damn good hiding place. I remembered the hayloft out in our barn, and I figured, you know, I could hide myself among the bales up there. Even maybe push some around like I had times before, when I wanted to build a fort or something, and get a perfect hiding spot. Denny started counting out loud from a hundred, and I took off running to the barn, the breeze tickling my cheeks, and I could even smell the harvest. I ran through those big red doors, and my eyes fell on Denny Lewis's mom laying on the ground, straw all in her hair. Her dress was hiked up and my daddy was laying on top of her, looking like he was trying to pick himself up, but he seemed to be having some trouble. I had no idea what I was seeing, but, <laughs> but I would later learn what my daddy was doing when I was 14, and me and Sandra Hagen made our way up to the same hayloft that I had hid so many times, had made so many forts in to get out of the rain. She shook the water from that beautiful, blazing red hair of hers, and then she, she noticed my eyes staring directly at her nipples that were poking out like little buttons in the cold, wet air. She hiked up that flowery dress of hers, she used to wear it all the time, and then she spread her creamy, white, freckled legs, revealing to me her sweet fire peach. Right there, in the smell of the spring and rain and old horse shit. I made love for the first time. What an absolutely beautiful girl she was. Daddy? My little voice rung out, echoing off the dusty wooden walls. My old man turned and stared at me, like he had been caught dipping his hand in the honey pot. And, for lack of a better word, that's exactly what he was doing. He hoisted himself off Miss Lewis and made his way over to me. What are you doing in here, son? He spoke slowly and calmly. Well, we was playing hide-and-seek, Daddy. I was going to hide up in the loft. Yeah? You ain't telling nobody what you saw here, right, boy? I could hear the anger rising up in his voice, but I kept pushing it like the curious little boy that I was. Well, what exactly was you doing, Daddy? He just... he stared at me, his eyes slowly glowing darker in the brightness of the fall. Miss Lewis was a ways behind him, and she was straightening her dress out and picking bits of straw out of her golden hair. I was too busy looking at Miss Lewis to notice that my daddy had meandered his way over to the wall where he kept his tools, and he picked out a hefty, dirty, crusty old shovel. You ain't telling nobody, right, boy? He repeated it in that same slow, calm way he always spoke when he was angry. But me, being the stupid child that I was, I, I just had to keep prying. Daddy? What was... I didn't even have a chance to ask a word before the right side of my cheek exploded with pain as I fell on the ground in a pathetic bundle. My vision went white hot. All the noise became muffled as if the world had been suddenly sucked into a vacuum. I could still hear what seemed distant, ghostly even. I could hear Miss Lewis screaming her pretty little head off, but strangely, also the long, low whistle of a train in the distance. Whether it was my imagination or not, I don't know, but I've learned in life that there is no such thing as coincidences. I've heard that whistle as clear as I could, as clear as I could hear Mrs. Lewis screaming, or Sandra Hagen's soft whispering moans as thunder rumbled across that gray spring sky and my father's harsh, labored breathing as he stood over me, brandishing that shovel like it was Excalibur. I heard that train. God help me, I heard it. 
You ain't gonna be telling nobody, you hear? D daddy I- Another explosion erupted as my father brought the shovel down on my exposed chest. I heard several pops and cracks echoing all throughout my body. I held up my small arms in defense, but they were crumpled like paper at the force of his blow. I dared raise my hands up for protection again, but only to see my fingers were crooked and bloody. Mrs. Lewis was no longer screaming, but babbling like she had seen a ghost. My father turned and waved his weapon. Shut up, bitch. Shut the fuck up, he yelled, his voice like that of an angry god. While he was distracted, I tried to crawl away, my crushed fingers clawing into the earth and straw, pulling myself to freedom. It was all for naught, though, as my father grabbed me by the leg and threw me towards the ladder to the hayloft. He's just a boy, Clay. He's just a boy, Mrs. Lewis kept muttering. He did nothing wrong. I said, shut up. He spoke again with that godlike force. He swung the shovel down on me again. I heard a very loud crack, almost like lightning skimming across the sky. Very faintly, I heard the train's whistle again, that loud shrill pitch in the distance. He flipped me over onto my back and spoke again. Are you going to be telling anyone about this boy? His voice had calmed down, but there was still a real deep anger in there, calm and intense. I felt one of my teeth fall into the back of my throat. A small amount of vomit and blood gushed from my mouth as I tried to cough it up. I feebly turned my head to spit it out. N no no daddy. I, I ain't telling no one. Good. My father tossed the shovel aside, scooped me up in his arms and carried me like I was just a baby. His voice had flipped to that of genuine concern, like any good father's. You okay boy? You took a mighty fall off that ladder. Right Janice? His head turned to Mrs. Lewis, still holding me in his arms. Her face was burning red with tears, and she nodded rapidly. Yes, yes. Are you okay, Daniel? Are you okay, sweetie? She rushed over and ran her shaking hands across my tiny, battered face. My father pushed me into her arms. Take him up to the house and into bed. Tell Martha what happened, okay? I'll go to town and get a doctor. Quickly now. Miss Lewis pulled me even closer and ran to the house to get my mother and put me down and got me comfortable until the doctor came. But before I blacked out, I remember Mrs. Lewis running across the field to my house, the smell of the harvest filling my nostrils, Mrs. Lewis quietly muttering how sorry she was. And in the distance, I saw what I could have swore was the faint shape of a moving black train, smoke pluming out of the engine, the slow chug, chug, chug of the wheels and that horrible shriek of the whistle, calling me to the darkness. The doctor had came and went, but I had no idea. I was unconscious the entire time. Broken hip, three broken ribs, one dislocated, a cracked skull, two missing teeth, four broken fingers, one broken wrist, and miles of bruises. Other bits of damage appeared over time. I lost my hearing and most of the sight out of the right side of my face. On a good day, and I can say that I had plenty of them, I had a slight limp. On a bad day, I was practically a cripple. My left hand froze up sometimes, and I couldn't move my fingers worth the damn. But I got along fine with my condition. My father was never found out, and the fact that Miss Lewis never came to the house again only meant that she would never speak about it. We all just sort of went on with life. I lived the best I could for about 10 years before I heard that whistle again. Now, it wasn't uncommon to see or even hear a train near the farm. Hell, there was a track not even a mile outside the front door. But this train... This train was different. The whistle didn't sound quite right. It was kind of like a dying rabbit. You know, nails against a chalkboard like steam spewing out of a kettle all rolled into one. It's like how that sound pierces through you and sends shivers down your very bones. Not a pleasant feeling, to say the least. I was 16 and living like my father's before me, working my hands in the earth. I had spent time at what my wife would later refer to as Hick School, 
But I left soon after. My teachers said that I was unteachable. I wasn't unteachable. I would have just rather spent my time reading or taking something apart or going somewhere that I have never been. The world was my playground and I wanted to play. The thought of leaving my mother alone with my father did scare me, though. I owed it to her to stay around and protect her. What my father did to me was just the tip of the iceberg compared to all the things he did to my mother. I remember laying up at night, hearing them fighting. My father's booming voice only broken up by the reality-shattering sound of glass or the cool, clean sound of flesh-on-flesh -flesh contact. My mother would be in the kitchen the next day with a few bruises, maybe a cut or two. But she never complained. It was plain for everyone to see, but they never paid it any mind. That's just how things were back then. I remember it was a pleasant enough summer night. A little humid, but that's just me being nitpicky. I spent most of the night out on the porch, watching the stars and listening to the creatures of the night as they went about their business. Occasionally, I found myself glancing out at that old barn. It stood like a mausoleum in the pale moonlight, an effigy to many things. Pain, lost love, hard work, and my family who died on this land before me. My mind wandered to memories of Sandra Hagen, God rest her soul. Memories of that shovel bearing down on me, like a locomotive bears down on those endless steel tracks. My mind liked to wonder whether or not I wanted to take the ride. Always has, always will. I remember my father driving up in his pickup truck. The bastard was swerving horribly. Obviously, he had indulged to his heart's contents in Jimmy Magruder's personal moonshine. What burns blue makes your blues go away, boy. He would always tell me that. I knew he'd be in a fighting mood and instinctively made my way up to my room. Before I could even reach the stairs, I heard his voice, dripping with that damned white lightning. Martha! Martha! You come here and welcome me home like a good wife should! He shouted in his normal slurred fashion. The ceramic jug in his hand spilled foul liquid onto the floor. My mother promptly came up from the cellar without a word and greeted him to his liking. Also, a kiss on the lips and the removal of his coat. As she turned to put his coat on the hook, he reached out and began to grope her. My mother, I will admit, was a pretty attractive woman, but years of beatings had slowly taken the brightness from her eyes, the skip from her step and the song from her lips. We made quick eye contact, but just a brief moment said it all. Go to bed, sweetie. Maybe it won't be so bad tonight. Just go to bed. But, like most nights, it was the same. Her giving in to this predator and his sexual advances, just to make him happy. She suffered through it in silence. God, the things she did for me, to provide for me. I pray every day that she is smiling down on me, while he's rotting in hell. My mind quickly wandered back to Sandra Hannigan. Did she suffer in silence? Did she let him take her every night? Or did she kick and scream and bite until she was just too tired? I don't know. I can't really say, God rest her soul. I pray that she fought back. I climbed the stairs to my room, trying to block out the labored breathing of my drunken father and the cold, complacent whimpers of my mother. Laying on my bed, I tried to nod off to sleep, just so it can all happen again tomorrow. Soon enough, sleep found me, and I dreamt. I dreamt a dream that haunted me for years. It would always pick up new details along the way. My father standing above me with its shovel, staring at me with the fury of a god, his eyes black as black can be, the shovel coming down. I closed my eyes in fear, only to open them, only to open them and see Sandra Hannigan before me, her beautiful smooth skin now all wormy and rotted. Her hair is still crimson, just, just as crimson as fresh blood, and a deep black line ran across her neck. Just too horrid to look at, but I can't look away. She hikes her tattered yellow dress up and reveals further decay of what was once just a beautiful sight. She speaks to me, her voice as crisp and clear as it was that day. You love me, 
don't you, Daniel? All the while, the slow, methodical chug, chug, chug of a train. Sandra opens her mouth, her cheeks tearing wide into a disgusting skeletal smile. To speak once more. Only, her voice isn't there. Only a sound that pierces right through you. Chilling you to the bone. Scratching at your soul. A whistle. I woke up absolutely sweating bullets, soaking my shirt and my underwear. But it wasn't the dream that woke me, as horrible as it was. No, it was the rumbling in my stomach for release. I didn't need to be told twice before I swiftly jumped out of bed and slipped on a pair of trousers, descended the stairs quickly and quietly, nearly tripping on the last step in the dark. I could see my father asleep in his armchair in the family room, his jug tipped over, empty and bone dry. The moonlight shone through the window, and I could see a line of drool falling out of the corner of his open mouth. His head tilted back in the way he always slept when he was in his chair. I quickly shoved on my shoes and rushed through the front door, and off to the little shed far to the house. The grass was swishing underneath my feet, and the wind cooled the sweat on my body. When I reached the outhouse, I flung the door open and took a squat right on the splintery seat without a second thought. There were always stories of porcupines finding their way into the outhouse and gnawing on the seats for the salt from sweat. But I can say I never did see a porcupine. A raccoon did once. Poor thing fell into the hole and drowned in the shit and piss of a small farming family. Kinda sad, really. That was years ago and the hole had been long since buried. I let myself relax and let the body do what it was trained to do in this type of situation. I nearly nodded off in this smelly little shack. But something jolted me off the seat. A whistle. Low and hot at first, but it grew into a cacophony, like a thousand screaming voices. I quickly cleaned myself up and hurried outside. There it was, less than a mile from where I stood, just sitting there on the tracks. Which wouldn't have been too uncommon, except there was no switching station out here. Just open land in those endless steel tracks. Like I said, I was a curious boy, and obviously something that had been haunting me for ten years was well worth a look. I broke out into a run, the excitement and fear gripping my heart. I wanted to look back at the house to tell myself that I'm just dreaming, but my feet kept moving. Thank God for the moon that night. You could see for miles. As I got nearer to the damn thing, it got darker. The smoke from the engine creeping into the sky started blotting out the light. The bright diamonds in their satin cloth began to disappear too. I stopped, only briefly panting and sweating. I looked up only to realize that I was right next to it. It was unlike any train I had ever seen. It was black all over. So black that it hurt my eyes to look directly into it for too long. It was also very noticeably darker right next to the massive machine, like it was devouring any light that got near it. Most trains that came through were just regular freight trains, carrying coal and such parts. But this was a passenger train. The interior of the cabs were brightly lit, revealing a deep red color scheme. And the people. Oh God, there were people in the windows. Each one just sat there emotionless, like some kind of statue from a long-lost civilization. I try to work my way to the front of the train. Each car was the same, filled sparsely with unknown, unmoving faces. One or two passengers did turn to look out the window at me, only to return to their original position, each eyes gray and sad. I kept on walking my way to the engine, till it finally caught my eye. In one of the windows, it... it was my father. I wasn't sure at first, but it had to be. It was my daddy. Daddy! I yelled out, but he didn't turn to look. Daddy! Hey, Daddy! I saw that the entrance to the car was wide open, the light spilling out onto the land. I had to get onto that car. 
Why was he on there? I thought to myself. What the hell is he doing? I hoisted myself up onto the metal steps into the car, only to be knocked back by a black mass that smelled of oil and smoke. I looked up to see a man standing there, soot-stained overalls and greasy white hair jutting out from underneath his conductor's cap. He stared at me intently, right before a smile cracked his lips. You ain't getting on, boy. His voice was flighty and uneven, high-pitched yet low and grumbly at the same time. You ain't got no ticket, ha! Huh? His laugh was unnerving, like the sound of crunching bugs underneath your boot. Why you wanting to get on anyways for, boy? His smile still beamed at me. A strange, skeletal smile, wide and menacing. I found myself reverting back to that scared little boy in the barn ten years ago. M my daddy's on there. I gotta talk to him. I he just bellow laughed at this. Boy, lots of people's daddies be on this train. No ticket, no ride. <laughs> he clapped his gloved hands together, puffing black dust off. Please? Please, I... No ticket, no ride, boy. His voice was becoming pretty clearly angry. That's when I truly saw him. His pale skin and free of any sort of blemish. And his eyes, they were on fire. Glowing orange like the coals that moved his train. Those fiery coal eyes burned right through me. Get out of here, boy. Don't come back till you got yourself a ticket. His teeth were jagged and pointed like a dog's teeth. I ain't afraid to say that I was scared. In fact, I pissed myself right then and there. He just laughed that crunchy laugh of his. Diamond. Pearl. Opal. Jade. Ha! He turned and slammed the doors behind him. Soon enough, the pistons started chugging their slow chug. Chug chug smoke bellowing out of the engine it smelled like rotten eggs and bloated summer roadkill i still just laid there in my own filth watching the black train slowly pull away the conductor stuck his head out of the engine booth and yelled back at me over the locomotive maybe next time eh danny boy ha <laughs> ha he said his eyes burning bright as ever he laid on the whistle Close up, I could truly hear what the sound was. It was screaming. Melting steel and burning souls screaming into the night. I could only watch as the train just pulled away. The screaming black behemoth just riding on those endless steel tracks. I walked back home, shaken and scared, questioning whether or not I had truly been dreaming, or if this was all some kind of nightmare. The moon was back out and shining in all its glory. The stars were sparkling in the dark folds of the sky. Finally reaching home, I numbly pushed the front door open. It groaned in protest, but I paid it no mind. I trudged my way into the family room, figuring my father would be gone. But there he was, still just sitting there. I quickly crossed over to him, my hand shaking as I touched his face. It was cold. I saw that it wasn't drool dribbling out of his lips. It was vomit. My father was dead to the world, drowned in his own sick. I saw the devil that night, and he took my father on a slow, screaming ride to hell. The funeral was just like any other. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. A man was buried on holy ground. Only me and my mother ever knew that this was no man, but a monster. I remember how she looked when they lowered him into that cold, hard earth. She had this little smile on her face. No tears, no anguish, just a smile. She was finally free. A few years later, she sold the farm. I want to go to the city. Leave this all behind, is what she would say. I didn't blame her. I was glad to leave. But I admit, I did miss the place once we were gone. And I know that she did too. It was a quiet life. A fine life. 
but she couldn't stand to be in that house where the memories ran rampant. They hid in every corner and behind every shadow, whispering to her, reminding her of who my father was. It was 1942. The world was at war and I could do nothing but work building bits and pieces for guns and tanks. Being partially crippled, I was 4F. I could only hear about how all my friends I had growing up had went over to fight for liberty, but came back in boxes. I suppose I was lucky on that part. My mother took up a job at the same munitions plant as me. Propaganda at its best, I suppose. It put a smile on her face. And that's really all I needed to know, that it was a good thing. We had been living with her mother in Boston, and life was fine. I liked my grandmother well enough, but she always looked at me like I was a leper. She saw too much of my father in me. She hated him for what he did to my mother. The beatings were a secret, but she hated my father for taking my mother away from her. A soldier returns home from war, knocks up a pretty young woman with the whole world in front of her, steals her back to his home where the fruit of several steamy nights ends up dying in its sleep. Yeah, my my sister didn't get much of a chance in this world, but I sure did. And she resented me for everything that I represented. A horny farmer turned soldier. It wasn't until I started bringing Claire around that she finally started to warm up to me a little more. Maybe Granny was finally seeing that I wasn't my father. Maybe she was going senile, I don't know. I can't say that I didn't love Claire. She was a wonderful woman. But I do know that I saw a hell of a lot of Sandra Hagen in her. That blazing crimson hair of hers. Those deep green eyes. Maybe it was me mourning over a long lost love. Or guilt for never stealing Sandra away from her life funny. Six feet of rope. It's weird how something so seemingly average could remove a person from this world, someone from your life. I loved Sandra. I did. And so did her daddy. Maybe just a little too much. She was probably praying that I would come to her window and rescue her, steal her away that night like Romeo and Juliet. She had something inside of her. Something horrible. Something God had forgot about. She wanted to be something beautiful, but it could never be. Poor Sandra. God rest her soul. I loved her. But I love Claire, too. Maybe not in a truly hopeless romantic the one way, but I loved her all the same. Claire and I were married at a lovely ceremony in 1945. The war was over. Our boys were coming home. And the world began to get even more scared of itself. The Reds were everywhere, they used to say. I don't know. Men were men. But it's their toys that ended up hurting them. I found work as a mechanic. And Claire, she was teaching. Money was tight, but we definitely didn't complain. We had an apartment to live in and each other. We didn't need to worry about much else. Until one day... When I got home from the shop and she was waiting for me. Hey, sweetheart. I cooed in her ear as I kissed the back of her neck like I always did when I got home. I'm late. What? I'm late. I don't know what you mean. She took my hand and she placed it on her belly. And it all hit me like a ton of bricks. You mean... Yes... She was trying to hold back her tears and smile, but they broke through anyway. I'm gonna be... Uh-huh. My son was born December 20th, 1949. The most beautiful baby boy I ever saw. William Hudson Bronson. He took after me, just like I had taken after my father. I was determined to make him have all the things that I could never have. But money was tight before and it definitely wasn't getting any better. My grandmother had died two years prior to the birth, and my mother was living all alone. But she delighted in seeing her little Billy B, as she called him. She loved him. She loved him with all her might. It did me well to see her so happy. 
Billy had just turned one when I got news that our old home was back on the market. My mother handed me a check of all the money that she had saved over the past 10 years. She told me that it would be good to go home, return to my roots, and raise Billy like I had been raised. I didn't think it was such a good idea. I just knew those memories would be waiting there for me, hiding in the shadows and waiting for me to let my guard down so they could strangle me. Any ghosts in that house have long since left, my mother said to me. It was a good life. I know that life was hard, very hard at times, but it's in your blood, Daniel. You don't like being a mechanic, do you? Haven't you been aching to get back to the land, watch the fruits of your work pay off? I did. I did miss the farm life, but I don't know how much I missed my farm life. We left Billy with my mother while Claire and I made our way back to my childhood home. The town had grown quite a bit, everything a modern family would need. When we finally did reach the farm, my eyes fell on the barn, and a deep chill ran through me. You okay? Claire asked me in that sweet, concerned voice of hers. Nah, I guess a goose walked over my grave, I suppose. The man who recently bought it was a rich yuppie who thought about trying his hand at the farm life, but he couldn't live without the amenities of a modern man. The house was fully wired, plumbing, and plenty of farming equipment, and a completely new paint job and decor. This wasn't my home anymore. It hadn't been for a long time. After our tour, Claire got into the car and immediately spilled out her opinion. We need to buy this house. You really think so? I do. I can work at the school in town and you can make a living here growing corn, raising cows, and doing whatever it is that farmers do. You really want to live here? I questioned. I did want to come back, but there was just too much in my head screaming at me not to come back. Yes. She stared at me intently. She knew that I would crack like always. She had that special kind of power over me. Then it settled. It's ours. We settled in and got our new life off to a great start. The land was good and the crops, they grew like weeds, and Billy was taking a liking to the open air. It wasn't much longer after our first harvest that Claire became late once more. We had our baby girl, Esther Mae Bronson. In the summer of 1953, she took after her mother in spades. It was truly a slice of the American dream. I would find myself walking out to the railroad tracks every now and then. I don't know what I expected to see. Maybe it was sort of my way of making sense of something so unbelievable. I never told anyone. Not once. Never. The devil and his hellbound train were my secret to keep. I wasn't crazy. I prayed to God that I wasn't crazy. Sometimes late at night, I could hear a train whistle pierce through the sky. A slow chug, 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 pushing the metal beast along those endless steel tracks. Sometimes, I swear under those whistles, I could hear screams. We led a fine life indeed. Belly was growing into a man before my very eyes, and Esther was blossoming into a beautiful young woman, more and more every single day. The year was 1968. Another war was going on halfway around the world, but it didn't bother me none. That was, until Billy came to me, and said that he was going to join the army. He wanted to fight for his country. Claire had a fit, as expected, but he had his mind set and he would be damned if anyone was going to change it. We got his letters every week, and every week, we would write back. I was sleeping. It came again. The first time in years, my father was standing over me, holding his shovel. His eyes were burning like orange coal. The shovel coming down on me, right before the scene melts away and I'm with Sandra. My lovely, rotting Sandra in the hayloft. Exposing herself to me in a morbid, yet sexually illicit manner. You love me, don't you, Daniel? 
you know I do. Her rotting lips formed a smile. Her gaping maw opened and revealed an unimaginable darkness. From the darkness came a low whistle. Slowly, but definitely, building into these deafening screams. I woke up sweating bullets, soaked my nightshirt and my pants. I didn't have to use the restroom. It was the whistle. It was cutting into the night, calling me like a sailor to the rocks. I silently slipped from bed and slipped down the stairs, each step creaking slightly under my weight. I slipped down my shoes and flung open the front door and started running. The wind chilled me a little bit in that slight autumn night. My mind raced with memories reaching out, not from the corners of the shadows of my home, but from my mind, reaching out trying to hold me and suffocate me. It was the same all those years ago. Smoke plumed from the engine, falling to the ground and lingering like a thick black fog. The deep black metal glared at me as I was walking alongside of the great beast. The devil stood outside of a car, watching me as I approached, his eyes burning with excitement. Diamond, pearl, opal, and jade. Ha <laughs> ha! Danny boy has come back, but still no ticket, I see. His voice just shattered through me, but I pressed on. Why are you here? Oh, my, 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 Danny boy. We all have a job to do. <laughs> and this is just my job. But why are you here? In that moment, I heard my father speaking to me in my voice. A calm, quiet anger. Dad? A voice from inside the car rang out like a bell. Out of the open doorway stepped... My son, Billy, clad in his official army gear, looking confused. Dad? B Billy? The words caught in my throat. I ran over and held him close to me, never wanting to let him go. Billy, why are you on this train? Don't know. I remember my squad was walking through the jungle, and then there was just this white flash. I woke up on the train. What are you doing here? I don't quite know myself. I laughed slightly, squeezing him tighter. It's good to see you, boy. How touching. The devil spoke up. You have five minutes, Billy boy. The devil stepped into the car and made his way to the engine. Once I knew that he was gone, I grabbed Billy and tried to pull him away. Come on, son, we gotta get you home. He pulled away from me. No. Billy. If this is what I think it is, then I can't leave. I can't, Daddy. We can go home right now. Tell your mother you're home and... No. I belong here. Who knows, maybe this train doesn't just go to hell. Maybe it makes us stop off somewhere else. I don't know. Billy, I... Daddy, I heard from some friends of mine who went home... They got problems, Daddy. I'd rather be dead than mangled and fucked up in the head. Sorry for cursing. It's okay, son. We stood there silently for a long time, just staring at each other, trying to think of the words to say. All aboard? Love you. I... I love you, Billy. Goodbye. The black metal behemoth pulled away from sight once more, screaming down those endless steel tracks. I waved goodbye to my son, long after the train was out of sight. Even after the screaming whine disappeared from the night air, I watched. I prayed. Just like every other week, we got a letter on that one, too. Only this time, it wasn't from Billy. Claire was wrecked. She couldn't leave the house for days, just laying around and crying, wailing that she could have kept him here. She should have kept him safe. She left me not more than a year after that. She said that she couldn't stand looking at me and just seeing Billy. I also know she hated me. 
I couldn't join her in her sorrow, in her pain. I got to say goodbye. I got closure. I don't blame her for hating me. But to take my daughter away from me is just cruel. It's punishment. I haven't seen either one of them in years. Many, many years. I did the best I could. I tried to live life the best I could with what I had. I was a good father. I was a good son. I was a good husband. None of that means a hill of beans in the long run, though. We all end up in the cold, hard earth, feeding the maggots and the creepy crawlies that haunt all of our nightmares. I can hear it now. The screaming. The screaming in the darkness. I've seen a lot of things in my life. Some things I'm more proud of than others. As a boy, I could satiate my appetite with the world around me. I suppose... I don't know. I suppose that there's just one last thing to figure out. That train is still there. And I finally got my ticket. Only one thing left to do. Is to take a ride. I would like to say thank you to all of my lovely patrons listed on screen right now. Dan R., Paul Z., Cody V., Chaos X., Mr. Swiston, Official Jerboa, JY, Pyromancer, Hayden MH, Ethan A., Dark Side of the Bear, Daniel H., and Maximilian Charles P. Guys, thank you so much. You single-handedly keep this channel alive.